This morning, I, I'd like to read for you John chapter 14. We're actually only going to be considering the idea that's in verse 31, but we have for us quite a bit of example in here as well as the call of our Lord Jesus Christ in verse 15 that we saw in the meditation. Jesus showed the world that He loved the Father through His exact obedience to His commandments. Jesus says, if you love Me, you will do the same. Let's begin in verse 1 of chapter 14 of John. We read this, and this is our Lord Jesus Christ addressing His disciples in what is called the Upper Room Discourse prior to His um, uh, being um, betrayed by Judas and handed over to the Romans. He says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us Jesus said to him, have I been with you or have I been so long with you and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and disclose myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you were going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. You heard that I said to you, I go away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Now I have told you before it happens, so that when it happens, you may believe. I will not speak much more with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. But so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Get up. Let us go from here. 
Now, certainly our Lord Jesus there had in mind the fact that He was going to give Himself up for sacrifice, and that is how He would obey the Father. But we also know Jesus obeyed His Father in everything, precisely, did precisely what His Father wanted Him to do, and that showed His love to Him. Now, what are some of the ways that you show your love to the Lord? I'm sure that you have very many ways that you do. I mean, obviously, you think about Him. How can you not think about the one that you love? Certainly, you desire Him in your heart. You, you sense a love for Him. Uh, that love bursts out in song. Uh, you sing songs of praises to Him. Uh, you tell Him that you love Him in song and also, of course, through prayer. You gather together uh, to worship Him. And certainly, you listen to what He has to say in His Word. And all of these are very good ways, certainly, but you need to understand, I need to understand, the text shows you one way that you can show Him even more, and that is through obedience. Now, these other things are certainly acts of obedience as well, but obedience more broadly to all the commandments. Now, that's also how the Lord wants you to show the world that you love Him. Now, you can certainly tell people in the world, you can say, I love Jesus Christ, but words are, after all, cheap, and if what you do doesn't agree with what you say, then it's going to undermine your words. If you really want to show the world that you love Jesus Christ, you need to obey Him. That is what Jesus did, precisely what the Father told Him. Notice what He told His disciples in our text this morning again but so that the world may know that I love the Father. I do exactly as the Father commanded me, exactly what He commanded me. You know, the Puritans <clears throat> were criticized in their day, and they continue to be criticized today, for being very precise. They were criticized for exactly what it is that Jesus Christ was doing in order to honor the Father, in order to show the world that He loved Him. Now, perhaps you've heard me use this illustration before, this Puritan pastor by the name of John Rogers. Uh, one day, a, a landowner saw Rogers riding past his property on horseback, and when he recognized him, he rode out and came alongside him and began to censure him for being so precise. Apparently, uh, he may, was a local pastor, and perhaps this, this lord of the manor was attending his church, and he knew what he had to say. But he censored him for being so precise in his religion. After he finished, he backed off a bit and he said, you know, being a gentleman in so many other respects, why is it that you are so precise in your religion? And Rogers replied, he says, oh, sir, I serve a precise God. I mean, a God who doesn't want just general sort of half-hearted obedience and kind of get it right. But he has a, something he wants us to do that is exact. You know, righteousness is exact. It is a razor's edge. And what I'd like for us to consider this morning is this, that if you are to show your love to the Father and to the Son and to the world as well, you need also to obey the way Jesus did. You need to follow His example in His precision. Now, what I'd like us to do this morning is simply consider, first, that this is what Jesus did, and second, I want you to see that this is what He calls you to do as well. Now, first of all, Jesus obeyed His Father precisely. Now, we know He did this for a variety of reasons. You know that Jesus Christ came into the world to keep His Father's commandments in order to fulfill all righteousness for you. You needed a perfect righteousness. You didn't have it. If Jesus had not obeyed, you could not be saved. Jesus' obedience did not just qualify Him to be our sin bearer in order to lay down His life on the cross. It is the obedience you need in order to enter into heaven. Jesus obeyed for you that you might be saved to give you a perfect righteousness. Now, you also know that when Jesus kept the commandments, that He didn't do it because He was forced to do it. He didn't do it under duress, but He did it willingly. He did it from His heart. 
because that's what he wanted to do, because he loved his father. David, when he was writing in Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8, was looking forward to the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he wrote this. Sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me, I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. I hope you understand what it means when he says the law was within his heart because this is exactly what the Lord gives you in the new covenant. He writes his law on your heart. He gives you a love for obedience. It was Jesus' pleasure to obey his Father because he loved him so much. You know that Jesus in his obedience kept all the commandments. He didn't leave anything out. He didn't just keep some of them. When Jesus came to John to be baptized, John tried to stop him, saying, you come to me to be baptized? I need to be baptized by you, Jesus. And you come to me. And Jesus said to him, permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then John baptized him. John realized that he was committed to doing what was right, and Jesus was committed to do it as well, not just in some areas, but in all areas. Jesus obeyed absolutely everything that his father commanded him to do because you realize that if he had missed just one thing, then he would have basically failed in everything. Uh, James reminds us, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Jesus kept all the commandments, otherwise he could not be the spotless lamb of God who lays down his life for our sins. He obeyed all that his father told him to do. Now that means as well that Jesus obeyed at all times and in all places. He never took a break from obedience, but he lived, he ate, and he breathed his father's will. As we saw in our passage last week in John 8, 29, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. In other words, Jesus was not a part-time Christ. He was a full-time Christ. But did you know or did you realize in Jesus' obedience that Jesus was precise in his obedience? As he says in our passage, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Now, this is very important because Jesus was not innovative. He didn't just think of things that he might, as it were, give to the Father, that he might sacrifice to the Father, that might be pleasing to the Father. He didn't try to second guess what it is that his Father wanted him to do. He simply did what his Father told him to do. He knew his Father's will, and he did it. And for him, that was enough. Now, what a novel idea. Sometimes it seems like the church is so busy trying to figure out what they can do, what they can get away with, as it were, within the framework of the commandments of God that they overlook what it is that they actually are to do, what it is that God calls them to do. That's certainly true with regard to worship, but it really applies to all of life, doesn't it? If we simply focused on what it is that we know God wants us to do, we wouldn't have to worry about what He might want us to do or what we might be able to to get away with. We would have plenty to keep us occupied. Now, Jesus' desire for precision with regard to the commandments of God, among other reasons, is why He lifted the commandments up again in the Sermon on the Mount because they had been corrupted by the teachers of Israel. And He wanted His people to know precisely what it is His Father wanted Him to do. Remember those many occasions where Jesus says, you've heard it said, but I say to you, and here's one example in Matthew 5, verses 21 through 26. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder. 
and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent in law while you are on or while you're with him on the way, so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Truly I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid up the last cent. Was Jesus concerned that we understand what the law of God say? Yes, that's why he lifted it back up to its previous position. Jesus didn't come into the world to do what the people of the world expected Him to do. If, if He had, then He would have been a friend of the world and the world would have befriended Him. But He actually did what God required of Him because He loved Him and because He wanted to show the world that He loved Him even though it meant they would hate Him and, as you know, crucify Him. When Jesus said, I love the Father, how could you know He was telling the truth? It was only by the fact that his life agreed with his words. He showed the world that he loved the Father through his precise obedience. And so now the question comes, well, if that's true of Jesus, what needs to be true of you? Jesus obeyed. He obeyed precisely. Do you need to do this? As a matter of fact, you do because Jesus is your example. If you are to show the Father and the Son that you love them, you need to obey. If you are to show the world that you love Him, you need to obey. You need to obey as Jesus did. You need to follow His example. Again, Jesus says in John 14, verse 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And that means not only will you submit to His command as He tells you to obey Him, but the love that is in you for Him, written on your hearts by His Holy Spirit, will compel you to do that. You'll want to be like Him. Now, certainly there is one difference between your obedience and Jesus' obedience. And this is really what the gospel is all about. Jesus kept the commandments that He might provide you, as we've already seen, with a perfect righteousness. You're not going to keep the commandments for that reason, because for one thing, you can't obey God perfectly. For another, if you try to keep them for that reason, to try to save yourself, that will not only not save you, but it will keep you under the curse, the curse of the broken, uh, as it were, covenant of works. Paul writes this in Galatians 3, verses 10 through 12, for as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. By the way, I want you to notice that God pronounces a curse upon the one who would keep His law but not do everything that is written in the book. That's why Jesus had to do everything. Otherwise, He would have fallen under the curse as well. He had to obey precisely and in all things in order to save us. But I want you to realize you can't do that. And I can't do that. And since you can't do that, that's why the gospel exists. Even your best works are still sinful. Every time you would try to offer your works to God, you would only earn death by your obedience. As Paul writes, the wages of sin is death, and that's all you can do is sin. Now, it's not that you're you know, purposely breaking the law of God all the time, but even our best works still are mixed with a lot of impurity, a lot of sin, a lot of desire for self-glorification, a lot of love for self, and not a pure love 
for God, and that's why it's not acceptable. That's why you can only have eternal life through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to turn from your sins and trust Jesus Christ because only His obedience can make you right with God. But with that one difference on the side, you do need to realize that you are still to follow Jesus Christ in every other area. You are to keep the commandments willingly. You are to keep all of the commandments. You are to keep them at all times and in all places, not to save yourself. But as the evidence that you belong to Jesus Christ, that the blessing of the new covenant is yours, that God truly has put His law in your mind, and He has written it on your heart. Remember, the problem with the old covenant was that the law was written on tablets of stone, and because of that, the people of God in the old covenant didn't follow God. They didn't care for Him, and God says, I didn't care for them either, so I'm going to make a new covenant. I'm going to take that law that was on stone, and I'm going to write it on hearts. I'm going to give my people a love for these commandments, and then they will know me from the least even to the greatest. Well, when God writes that law on your heart, then you do keep the law of God willingly. You keep the whole law of God. You do it at all times and you do it in all places, but you will also do it with the kind of precision and exactness that our Lord Jesus Christ did. You won't try to offer Him what you want, but you will give to Him what He wants in every area. There's a great example of not doing this in the Old Testament. Remember when God sent Saul out to fight against the Amalekites? He says, I'm going to blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven, and I want you to do this, Saul, and when you go out there, I want you utterly to destroy all the Amalekites and everything that belongs to them. But you know that Saul didn't do that. He spared Agag, the king, and he also spared the best of the livestock in order to make a sacrifice to God even though God had commanded him to destroy everything. Well, when he attempted to do that, what did Samuel have to say to him, Samuel, the prophet of God? He says, has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. God doesn't want your sacrifices. He wants your obedience. The only thing He wants you to offer to Him is what He calls you to do. And knowing that He wants you to follow what He says to the letter, you won't be content just to have a general idea of what it is God wants you to do, but you will study His Word in order to know precisely what it is He wants you to do. Now again, are you going to succeed? Are you going to be able to do what Jesus did even with the grace of God? Well, really, no. The Bible says you're not going to succeed, but that won't keep you from trying. You know, many believe that God only requires what it is you're capable of doing. You know, He won't ask you to do anything beyond what you actually can do, but that isn't true. Jesus said to His disciples and He said to you, He says to you as well, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's what Paul tried to do and um, what the Lord calls you to do through his example as he exhorted the Philippians. He says, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as are perfect have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. Now Paul says he hadn't obtained perfection, right? Uh, but that was the standard, and that was what he was seeking for. You know, on the basis of passages like what Jesus said, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, and Paul says, I'm not perfect, but I'm striving for perfection. 
there's, there's just about everything you can imagine within the church as far as on one end of the pole or another. Some would say you don't have to keep the commandments. Others say unless you keep the commandments perfectly, you're not actually saved. Of course, you kind of wonder whether they can even be, I mean, either of these can be within the bounds of Christianity. But there are those who say on the basis of this passage, you actually can be perfect. I mean, Jesus commands you to be perfect. And Paul said that's what he was striving for. But don't forget, the Bible reminds us again and again, even though that is the standard, you can never attain it. As a matter of fact, if you think you've attained it, you really can't even be a Christian. Listen to what John writes in 1 John 1, 8 and 9, very familiar passage. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, the standard is perfection, but you're not going to attain it. But does the fact that you can't be perfect mean that you shouldn't try to be perfect? No, perfection is always going to be the standard even though we always fall short. You don't lower the standard because you can't attain it. Jesus is the standard. He is the example we are to follow, and He is perfect. What it does mean, though, is that while you're in this world, before you attain the perfection that is in heaven, you need Jesus' mediation. You need Him to stand between you and the Father to reconcile the two of you through His death and through His perfect life and to keep you reconciled until you finally arrive in heaven. If you trust Jesus, He will do that for you. He will keep you reconciled and He will make sure that you see heaven. And so to sum up what we've seen, with regard to yourself, you are to follow Jesus. You are to obey Him. You are to obey all His commandments. You are to obey all the time and in all places. And you are to obey from the heart as precisely as you possibly can to show your love to Him and to show the world that you love Jesus Christ. But I couldn't help but think that as this passage pushes us all in this direction, of one thing that could very likely happen if um, you actually b begin to believe you attain a measure of success. And that is that as you follow Jesus in His obedience and as you see yourself beginning to grow, don't forget that you also need to follow Jesus Christ in His example of love and patience with others who may not have actually attained as much knowledge and as much obedience as you have. You need to follow Jesus in not condemning those around you who aren't perfect. You know, this is again one of the, one of the downsides of, of reading books that elevate your understanding of what it is that God wants. I mean, the Puritans, as I told you, were very precise. And they wrote a lot of books about how we should serve and honor God. And you read those books and you say, this, this is great. I mean, this, this really shows me what God wants. And, and you have these lofty ideas of what God wants. And as you see those things, you begin to look at everybody else around you and you see that they don't understand it the same way and they're not seeking those same things. And you can be tempted to look down on everybody else because they don't see things the way you see them. And they're not seeking to live as you live. But don't forget what Jesus did. Being absolutely perfect, understanding perfection as He did, looking at His disciples day in and day out. Did Jesus stand over them and condemn them? Did Jesus stand over them and criticize them constantly? No, Jesus kept doing what was necessary to love them and encourage them to do even better. He encouraged them to strive after perfection. He didn't take the hammer of the law and bang them over the head with it. But instead, He loved them and lifted them up. So make sure in your desire to be like the Lord Jesus Christ that you not only seek to imitate His precision in His obedience to obey all the law of God, but also His love. As you do this, not only will you show the Father and the Son that you love them, but you also give the world the witness that the Lord wants you to give the world. Remember what Jesus said by this, all men will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. 
May the Lord help us uh, to do so. Amen. Let's pray. Just let's spend a few moments in silent prayer.